I just want to end, I have a minute and a half with some real challenges um, facing adults right now. One is discontinuous services. Okay, there's not a lot of services out there. Okay, there's not a lot of interest in adults. You know, U.S. Department of Human Services data, 2004, the last year from which these data are available, programs serving adults with developmental disabilities in general, including autism, have annually a 50% staff turnover rate and a 10% vacancy rate in terms of staff. You can't run a good McDonald's with turnover like that. And part of that is it, there's no, uh, it's not a career path seen to work with adults. I have an entire career based upon the fact that nobody else ever wanted my jobs. <laughs> okay, we have to change that, okay? We have to do that. I think there are issues in community understanding and we need to go beyond the fact that it is just Autism has a significant, challenging developmental disability that impacts families and impacts communities and, and costs a lot of money. $32 billion, by the way, annually, according to Gans in his survey of what it costs. $32 billion annually. Okay, costs a lot of money. All right? To say, yeah, but he can be your friend. And he can be your, your employee. He can be your coworker. And he can be your neighbor. And he can be, you know, in your school. And he can work at the Walmart by where you are. And you can actually, like, see him when you're there. That's the message that we also need to get out. Okay? Um, a couple other issues, I do a lot of work just, you know, in the criminal justice system with individuals with an Asperger's syndrome label who've gotten involved in the criminal justice system. And how do we best serve them? And most of the time they get in trouble, it's because they don't understand what they did. Okay? It's just, it's a big, I'll give you a very quick example. I have a client who got 18 months in prison because he hung out with a group of kids who were bad influences on him. And actually he did smoke marijuana with them and they would use him as their dupe. They would give everything to him, and he got arrested for something else not related to it, and we had it set up so he would go to court, and the judge would read him the riot act, and we showed him the prison, we showed him all this stuff, so that, and so he, hopefully he wouldn't do it again. We came into court, everything's all set up, he's sitting there, we're all there, the judge comes in, bailiff says, all rise, he, st he doesn't stand up, he sits there. Judge says, young man, stand up. He stands up, but he has his hands in his pockets. Judge says, young man, take your hands out of your pockets in my court, and he drops a bag of marijuana on the courtroom floor. <laughs> Why? Because he was saving it for his friends, and he didn't want anybody to steal it, and I didn't tell him, don't take your dope to court. Okay? 18 months in prison. Now, yes, it's a crime. Yes, it's an offense. Absolutely. Okay? But it's a different issue than it would be with anybody else. Lastly, I just want to tell you one, very, one last story and then I'm done. Um, Jim Sack is the chairman of the Organization for Autism Research, a great friend of mine, um, been my best adult friend for 15 years. He's a lawyer in DC. He has four kids. His two youngest kids have autism. His daughter, Dana, is a doll. She's 21 years old now. Verbal, but not classically high functioning. Um, calls me Uncle Petey, which I really like. Very, very cool. She has my whole life planned out for me. She wants me to, like, to get remarried, have kids, have a horse. Like, she has this whole list for me. Much to my wife's chagrin, actually. <laughs> um, but his son James has classic autism. He's nonverbal, but he's kind of a happy kid. His favorite thing in life, his favorite stereotypical thing, he loves Starbucks green straws. He just likes to have Starbucks green straws. And he doesn't sort of flip them around. He just likes to know they're there. You know, if you're old enough to remember the old Calgon commercials, like Calgon, take me away, like that's what the green straws are. He starts to get upset, and he sees the green straws, and he's like, Okay, I can deal. I can deal. Well, about seven years ago now, the school called, and they said, we have an IEP meeting coming up, this individualized education plan, and we want to talk about the green straws because this is inappropriate. He shouldn't have the green straws anymore. Now, never mind that he goes every Sunday to Starbucks with the family. Everybody at Starbucks knows him. You know, it's a big thing. It's, it's a really nice community inclusion. And Jim called me and asked me what I thought about the green straw thing. And I said, Jim, you know what, if you want... I'll come down and I'll sew him a little leather biker's wallet to keep his green straw in. I'll, I'll teach him to hold it behind his ear. I'll make a bracelet out of it and keep it around his wrist. I said, but you can't take away his green straw. And he said, yeah, well, I knew you'd say that. That's why I called you. But I'm going to go to this meeting, and they're going to have their, their no green straw buttons on. And <laughs> what do I say? I say, well, and probably the only smart thing I've ever said in my life, you tell them they should be so lucky to have a green straw in their life. That's what you tell them. <laughs> And James still has his green straw. And for me, what that's come to mean as our obligation, our obligation as society to people with autism, 
is one, to make sure that as we move in helping them, as we provide education intervention, not only don't we take away green straws, but we provide the services and intervention and supports so that they get more green straws. And if we do that, then I think we've done what we're supposed to do. And I thank you all very much for your kind attention. And I thank the City Club for having me here today. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to a Friday forum featuring Dr. Peter Gerhardt, president of the Organization for Autism Research. We will return to our speaker in a minute for the traditional City Club questions. We encourage you to formulate your questions now and remind you that they should be brief and to the point. We welcome all of you here and those listening to WCPN 90.3 FM, WCLV, WTAM, or one of the many radio stations across the country. Radio broadcasts of the City Club are made possible through the generous support of Case Western Reserve University. Our television broadcast partners are WVIZ PBS IdeaStream and Time Warner Cable. Television broadcasts are supported by National City, now a part of PNC, and Cleveland State University. Closed captioning is supported by Nordsum Corporation. Our live webcasts are supported by the University of Akron. Today's forum is the annual Myron N. Crotinger Endowed Forum, recognizing a gift from the Crotinger family. Also today, we are pleased to welcome guests at tables hosted by Baker Hostetler and Positive Education Program. Now we would like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphone today is City Club Director of Development and Education and Outreach Coordinator, Deborah Agosti. Now, please, first question, please. A and Jessica Allen. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, Dr. Gerhardt. A couple of questions. First, you mentioned that uh, autism is a genetic condition, largely if not all, mm -hmm. uh, does that mean you find it in family clusters uh, of people that have it in the same family and that can that be used to plan a, uh, you know, to plan, make a plan of action as to what to do after a child is born with autism from that standpoint? Second question, you said it is uh, a whole life experience. It is, is it always con uh, congenital or are there instances where it is not, uh, does not develop uh, until adult onset? Um, first, thank, first, thank you very much for your question. First question is, um, among all the developmental disorders, autism has the highest concordance rate among MZ twins, monozygotic twins, so identical twins. Um, we see a very high, so there is a very high inheritability. Uh, I believe that if you have one child with autism, your probability of having another child with autism is about one in five, so it's pretty high. Okay, and there is um, a lot of research going on in the area of what are called baby sibs projects, where if a family has one child with autism, when they have their second child, they're enrolling the child into these studies right away to look at, can we identify any sign very early on? And if we can identify early on, can we intervene even earlier? Um, as I said before, we do know that early intervention, particularly something called early intensive behavioral intervention, there's a percentage of kids who get this around the age of three to five, even a little earlier, who go on to lose their diagnosis later. Other kids go on just to show some dramatic improvements. They still stay on the spectrum, but you know, there's, there's, part of that may relate to during this period of time, the brain is very plastic, neuroplasticity. And by, in effect, forcing kids to learn at that time, to put it, it um, colloquially, that they do acquire all these skills and they can sort of go on to um, acquire new language in more typical ways. So uh, that can be used for identification and better diagnosis. With our screening methods now, we have gotten to the point, thankfully, where we're more accepting of false positives. We used to be so afraid of the false, like telling a family that their child might have autism when they didn't, that was considered the cardinal sin. Now the cardinal sin is the other way around. Not telling a parent their kid might have autism when he might have it. 